on this 25th of November 2018, this Lord's Day evening, a further series of uh, a further sermon in a series of sermons that we have been busy ourselves with for some time. My title is uh, sounds as follows this evening: Our glorified and reigning prophet, priest, and king works much more mightily now than before he ascended to his father. Our glorified and reigning prophet, priest, and king works much more mightily now than he ascended than before he ascended to his father. We started with that last week, and we saw that the Lord Jesus told Mary, do not cling to me. Do not try and hold me here and keep me here. This is going to be bad. It would be bad for you if you could manage to do so. But because I'm, I'm ascending to my father and your father, to my God and your God. And we also saw last time the wonderful truth, precious truth of First Corinthians 15 and verse 45. The first Adam became a living soul. The last Adam, a life-giving spirit. Now that Christ has gone back to his Father, having successfully completed his work of salvation here on earth, in his body of humiliation, having died upon the cross, having risen from the dead in his glorified body, his perfect body, having become the first man to be in his perfect body, body, in a glorified body uh, in this world and having ascended from the Mount of Olives on the 40th day after his resurrection from the dead and having on the 50th day on the Pentecost day of Pentecost according to God's um, wonderful promises Old Testament promises and some of Christ's New Testament promises said that the time of fullness would come the time of much more abundance started becoming started to be made true on the day of pentecost and since that time the glorified christ the lord of glory has been making progress in a much more mighty way than he had been doing when he was still in this world he meant it seriously when he said, it is better for you, it would be, it's going to be beneficial to you that I go to my Father. Because then I will send you the other comforter. And then you will do the greater works. He will do the greater works. Uh, you will do, he will do greater works than I am doing because I go to my Father. Every Christian do greater works than Christ did in a certain sense. Because when I speak in the name of Christ, something happens that Christ could not do and did not do when he was still in this world. He did not speak to the people as the life-giving spirit. He was still in his flesh. He was still... He was the God man, yes, but he hadn't become the life giving spirit in the fullest sense of the word yet. Now I can say, as I preach, and as I, when I preach in the power of the Spirit of Christ, the glorified Christ of heavenly glory, sitting on the throne of heaven, ruling and reigning from there, is speaking through me. That's a greater work. And what the Apostle Paul said, Christ in you and amongst you, the hope of future glory. We have dwelling in our midst the glorified Christ of, heavenly, of, 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 of heaven, which was not true when he was here. As we said last time, he broke through all the restraints of time and space. And he can now do su such wonderful things in this new era. Let me read to you, and I'll have to do some paging tonight because I did not have time to put in markers in my Bible. Acts chapter 1. 
the first verse or two. Let's read the first book of uh, verse of Acts and also the last verse and, con and, and compare the two and learn a lesson in the context of what I have been speaking about. Acts chapter 1 and verse 1. In the first book, O Theophilus, I have dealt with all that Jesus began to do and teach. Verse 2. Until the day when he was taken up taken up to heaven after he had given commands through the Holy Spirit to the apostles whom he had chosen. Chapter 1, Dr. Luke wrote in the book of Luke. But chapter 2 of Christ's history, the works that he continued to do and the way in which he continued to work and teach was much more glorious and he's still continuing to be much more glorious <coughs> chapter one was what we find in the book of luke chapter two is what we find in the book of acts that is what luke meant and what we find in the book of acts is life more abundantly the Christ of glory was reigning from the right hand of his father, having been invested there by the father after he arrived there in his glorified body. Arriving there in triumph, having triumph over all sin and Satan and hell and all our enemies and the world, everything on our behalf. He came there, he arrived there, to receive the fullness of the Spirit from his Father for the final time. And together with his Father, on the 50th day, he made true the promise of the Father and of himself, because he also reminded them of the Father's promise, and he also made the promise, not only did the Father do so, you shall receive power from on high when the Holy Spirit shall come upon you. And you shall be my witnesses in Judea, in, 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 in Jerusalem. Christ remained in the little land of Israel. All his living years as he was in his glorified body. But it was much different, chapter 2. By implication, when, as Luke said here in the first book, I have dealt with all that Jesus began to do and teach. He meant in this second book, I dealt with what Jesus continued to do and to teach. And as we read the book of Acts, in summary form, sermons we find in summary form, and many things have just been summarized, just got summarized, we find that the Christ of heavenly glory he has indeed shed out his, poured forth his Holy Spirit. We know the history of the book of Acts. They had so experienced so much joy and fullness, the 120 disciples, that Peter had to stand up, the apostle Peter, and he said, do not think these men are drunken with wine, as you suppose, because some said they are drunk, they became drunk with wine. They drank too much wine, because they, why did he say that? No, because they were so filled with joy. They experienced so much more joy than they experienced when the Lord Jesus Christ was here. Because the kingdom of God is not what we eat and what we drink, but is living righteously, is righteousness and peace and joy in the Holy Spirit, especially now in the time of the fullness. And Christ acts from heaven as our heavenly priest by giving us the oil of gladness in abundance they were so filled with joy with the love of christ because the living christ was uh, uh, filled the hearts and the minds and the emotions and the wills and the desires of all those disciples and peter just stood up and preached but the other others stood up in solidarity with him and as he preached about, he, he preached in the power of the Spirit, 
with so much joy at this, the quickening life giving Christ through His Spirit made true what we find in, as prophecy in two verses. I want to mention two because we said we are going to keep the sermons shorter again. Amos verse 9 and verse 13 is the first one that I want to mention. Amos chapter 9 and verse 13. Behold, the days are coming, declares the Lord, when the plowman, plowman shall overtake the reaper and the treader of grapes him who sows the seed. In other words, things are happening so quickly and at such a rapid pace that the one guy is still sowing the seed and still plowing and the other person is already reaping a mighty harvest. And all the mountains shall drip with sweet wine, and all the hills shall flow with it. Now this will become true of Israel in the future, but it started to become true on the day of Pentecost. The plowman overtook the reaper, and the treader of grapes, him who sowed the seed, a nation was born in one day. That's the other scripture. Uh, Isaiah, Isaiah 66 and verse 8. Isaiah chapter 66 and verse 8. Oh, but let's read verse 7 as well. Before she was in labor, she gave birth. The apostle Peter didn't have time to, to have labor pains for the last. Because the Holy Spirit just started working. Remember they were praying for themselves before the day of Pentecost, those 10 days. They were not praying for, for, uh, for, 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 for the lost. They were praying for themselves to be filled with the Spirit. The Apostle Paul, according to Romans 9 verses 1 and further, and Romans 10 verses 1 and further, had a deep longing in his heart and he had made incessant prayer with much sorrow in his heart for the lost Jews. But the Apostle Peter didn't have that opportunity. Before she was in labor, she gave birth. There was no time for these movements, bowel movements, spiritual bowel movements. We know that because we are not in times of refreshing now, we do not experience it in that way. But all through the passing centuries it happened again and again. God surprised us, as Joe said, with the early rains and the latter rains. And before she was in labor, she gave birth. That's a very unnatural thing. That's a supernatural thing. That's a glorious thing. Before they could pray for the salvation of the last 3,000 got saved. Before her pain came upon her, her birth pains came upon her, she delivered a son. But she didn't deliver one son. They delivered 3,000. 3,000 in one day. Very shortly after that, 5,000 men. Very shortly after that, after the history of Acts 4, Acts 4 verse 32, a multitude. In other words, things happen much more rapidly and in much more abundance because Christ is the one who has broken through all the barriers and all the restraints of being a man. We do not know him after the flesh anymore. We know him as after the spirit according to 2 Corinthians 5. And then the amazement of the prophet because he saw this coming hundreds of years before that. Verse 8, who has heard such a thing? Who has seen such things? Shall a land be born in one day? Or as it is, uh, and shall a nation be brought forth in one moment? A nation, it takes time to build a nation. Even in the nations, amongst the nations where it goes better than it goes here, where the Germans do not even manage to keep their numbers prepared, they do not even come up with two children. So they're going backwards. But even where people 
uh, are prolific in childbearing and child rearing, it doesn't happen overnight. But God said, I'm going to surprise you. I'm going to show, show you what the power of Christ's resurrection means. The power that I speak about in Ephesians 1. Before she was in labor, she gave birth to 3,000, then 5,000, then a multitude. And not only through the apostle Peter, the Lord of glory worked, but he worked through the other disciples according to Acts 4 as well. The glorious Christ, the Christ of heavenly glory was in heaven working from there as the living king and prophet and priest. But he worked in and through them and he quickened their word in such a way that he became, that Peter became a wonderful evangelist and he caught many fish. But then according to Acts 4, every brother, every sister in the church also became sister evangelist and brother evangelist and they caught a multitude. You see, when the Christ of heavenly glory, whom we now know after the spirit, not after the flesh any longer, we have broken through all the barriers of time and space, starts working, anything can happen. He can save a million within a second. He can use a split of a sentence in order to overpower the person's mind and bring him to spiritual birth and regenerate him and make him a child of God. Before her pain came upon her, she delivered her son. Who has heard such a thing? Who has seen such things? Shall a land be born in one day? The answer is normally no. Shall a nation be brought forth in one moment? Normally not. But as soon as Zion was, Zion was in labor, she brought forth her children. Some had the opportunity. Interestingly enough, we have an interplay between verse 7 and the last part of verse 8. Before she was in labor, she gave birth. And then, as soon as Zion was in labor, she brought forth her children. Both were true. Both happened from the day of Pentecost. They started praying for the others to get saved. But on the day of Pentecost, before they were in labor, she brought forth children. Because the great Christ of heavenly glory worked mightily as the heavenly priest, the king priest, to save his elect people. Through a weak man like Simon Peter. And in this New Testament era, he uses us in our weakness to show his unending, illimited, but unlimited power, limitless power. And then also, uh, let us just think what happened. Let me just take certain verses at random. All kinds of miracles. Acts chapter 14 and verse 20. I'll have to turn there now. I do not have any markers. Acts chapter 14 and verse 20. I still tell you I will get to the last verse of Acts as well. I'm going to do so soon. Acts chapter 14 and verse 20. Okay, let's start with verse 19. Paul stole, stole, stoned at Lystra. Jews came from Antioch and Iconium, and having persuaded the crowds, they stole, stoned Paul. Threw stones upon him. To kill him. And they thought he was dead. They thought they had success. Maybe they had success. We do not know. And dragged him out of the city. They thought he was, they were taking his, his dead corpse out of the city. Supposing that he was dead. She, they stoned him in such a bad way. He looked like a corpse. You know a corpse looks different. Have you been where a person dies. And suddenly you, you see his face becomes like granite. It's a very awkward thing, if, especially if the person is not saved. And he seemed to be dead, maybe, but, but maybe he was not dead, but she, they supposed he was dead. Verse 20, but when the disciples gathered about him, they made a circle around him, sort of thing. He rose up and entered the city, 
And on the next day, he went on with Barnabas to Derby. Verse 21, when they had preached the gospel to that city and had made many disciples, uh -huh, they were there in a very brief period of time and made many disciples in a very short time. The Lord Jesus didn't gather many disciples in three years. They made many disciples in a very short space of time. They returned to Lystra and Iconium and to Antioch. Verse 22, strengthening the souls of the disciples, encouraging them to continue in the faith and saying that through many tribulations we must enter the kingdom of God. Here we have Christ as the mighty, almighty king. He says, I am such a king now, in the fullness of my heavenly glory, that I can make people subject to me. Psalm 110 verse 3, Your people shall be made willing in the day of your power. Those who was, remained his enemies, who hated him, suddenly their hearts were melted, suddenly they realized their sins, suddenly they felt constrained to come to Christ, drawn to him with cords of heavenly love, and suddenly they were all saved. This irresistible, glorious grace, without making robots of the people, but they come because they want to come. The love is just too much and too overwhelming. Christ as the King, Christ as the priest saving his people, and as the king ruling and reigning in their minds, in their hearts, and their feelings. And we know these people were so on fire for the Lord and became so strong so quickly in so many cases, didn't remain babes as long as they remained in their first love. And then Christ as the heavenly king priest also strengthening the brothers who were under much stress and, uh, and, and pressure they said, let's preach the gospel, and we already now won a lot. Let's go. We leave the babies here for a while. Maybe we'll get back to them. But we must now first go back to the sheep and to strengthen them. Christ wants to, through the Christ of heavenly glory, wants to strengthen them in a priestly way through our preaching. And the way in which they strengthened the brothers and the Christ of glory did it through their words was not, ah, Let's feel bad along with you. No, we come to strengthen you by telling you, you know what, brothers and sisters, we must enter into the kingdom of God through much tribulation. You see, when the Christ, the Christ of glory does not function on a soul level, he functions on the spirit level. We know Christ after the spirit now. We know ourselves in Christ after the spirit, and we do not bother about the psychological stuff we say do you know what we encourage you by this mess through this message you are going to suffer much more persecution but do please remember that this persecution leads to eternal glory and the people were encouraged and then they could appoint elders it didn't take that long to have find elders you know, the moment the church has the combination of two things. Men who have been called to full-time ministry and enough money, or enough faith for the money, we will be able to plant churches all over the place. We need the power of the Spirit. Because remember, Christ remained in Israel. The disciples did not remain in Jerusalem. They went to Judea. They went further afield to Sam Samaria, then unto the uttermost parts of the world and the earth, and people got saved all over the place. Because you see, the one thing of the, 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 the Christ that was in his body of humiliation when he was here, he could only speak to one person at a time or a few people, but he couldn't be with them somewhere else at the same time. But now he can be with his people all over the world. At the same time, he has become the life-giving spirit. 1 Corinthians 15 and verse 45. And there is no uh, constraint upon him. It all depends on the sovereign will and decree of the Heavenly Father, how many are going to get saved. And when the times of refreshing has come that the Father had uh, uh, decided to, uh, uh, at, 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 
decreed in his own in his eternal decree according to his eternal decree before the times before time started before, in eternity past he saves those people he can save one in ten years or he can save a million in one day that is the fullness the fullness there's no uh, limit now so you see how Christ made his promise through the one through that will believe in me and that will function in my resurrection power when I will be in heaven will do the greater works. Peter did the greater works. Paul did the greater works. The brothers and sisters of the Jerusalem church of Acts 4 did the greater works. And then, let us understand here, they stoned Paul. They thought he was dead. Maybe they just had, had just left a few minutes before. Ah, finished with Paul now. We got rid of him. And maybe unbeknown to them, the disciples formed a circle around him, surrounded him. We do not even know, I suppose, they prayed. Uh, Dr. Luke could summarize so well, he didn't even say that they prayed, but I believe they did pray, and suddenly Paul was up and going. How miraculous, how supernatural. A man who was stoned so badly will have to stay in hospital for weeks or months. But the very next moment he was on his way. To go and preach and together with another man of God to make a lot of disciples then going back to another place to strengthen and encourage the brothers in a supernatural way, not in a, in a, on a psychological level, but on a spiritual level. The Christ who has become the life-giving spirit works in this mighty way. And, okay, let's now do what I wanted to do. Acts 1, verses 1 and 2 shows us Chapter 2 is the more glorious chapter because now he's in heaven. Now he's a ruling and reigning one. Let, uh, let, let, let us now read the last two verses of the book of Acts. We, we read the beginning. Let's read the end. Acts chapter 28, verse 30. Paul lived there two whole years at his own expense. In other words, he was living in a rented, he rented the place like I rent a place now here. And welcomed all who came to him. Verse 31, proclaiming the kingdom of God and teaching about the Lord Jesus Christ with all boldness and without hindrance. And those who were elected, had been elected to eternal life got saved. Do you remember what we had? In other words, you know what we have between the first two verses of the book of Acts and the last two verses of the book of Acts? We have a lot of opposition, a lot of satanic opposition working through men, stately powers, political people, people with much money, power and influence, people from the synagogue of Satan. But Paul said, I am in change here. He was in jail many times, but he said, you know what, I'm in chains, but the word of God is not bound. The word of God is running swiftly because the heavenly Christ working through my letters is working mightily and making it alive to many people at the same time. Although I'm here, Christ is not bound. His word is not bound. I work in and I function in the power of the spirit of the resurrected Christ, which is the greatest power in the entire universe. Please go and read Ephesians 1 verses 19 to 23 and you will see that see that you, uh, let's now take one or two more examples i see the time is really running swiftly acts chapter 27 and verse 24 paul sails for rome he was in a little ship those puny little ships couldn't can't compare can't compare to the ships of nowadays and they were going to die. They thought they were so afraid. But then Acts 27 and verse 20. If you read the storm at sea from verse 14, you see it was really going bad with them. And the, the, the outlook was very dark and grim. Acts 27 and verse 24. And... Well, let's start with 21 to get some context. Since they had been without food for a long time. That's not an easy situation. 
all these sailors with Paul there as well, without food for a long time. That's what you call an involuntary fast. You do not want to fast, but you have to fast because there's no money, because you, there's no food and no shop to go because you're on the sea and your ship is going to, to uh, is ready to break up. Paul stood up among them. You don't, people do not feel well when they, uh, when they have been without food for many, many days, for a long time. Once when we had to land in France, France, we couldn't land because there was bird feathers all over the place. And the pilot said, we have to continue flying, flying, flying. And we continued flying for hours. I thought, when, when is his fuel going to get up? And the passengers were getting unhappy and said, we want tea. And he said, you're not going to get any tea. And then they were even more unhappy. That was only a few hours in there. But these people had been without food for a long time. And I suppose their morale must have been, become very low. But God's, man, God's man's morale was not, had not become low. Verse, uh, Paul stood, uh, since they had been without food for a long time, verse 21, Paul stood up among them and said, Men, you should have listened to me and not have set sail from Crete and incurred this injury and loss. 22. Yet now I urge you to take heart, for there will be no loss of life among you, but only of the ship. The Christ of glory is the heavenly ultimate prophet. And he was speaking a prophetic word through Paul. He showed Paul as the great prophet. Paul as apostle became Mr. Prophet, brother prophet. And he said only the ship will go to pots. But no life will be lost. Everyone will be saved. Take courage, men. Take courage. Even courage for the lost. Uh, encouragement for the lost. Even for the, the those who are, were not elect amongst them. You should have listened. You made a mess by, by going, by setting sail. But God is with me. The Christ of glory is with me. And therefore, take heart. For there will be no loss of life among you but only of the ship. I thought, I wonder whether the, some of them thought he had become star craving mad or what. How many did really believe him? Verse 23, For this very night they stood before me an angel of the God to whom I belong and whom I worship. And he said, verse 24, Do not be afraid, Paul. You must stand before Caesar. And behold, God has granted you all those who sail with you. Verse 25, so take heart, men, for I have faith in God that it will be exactly as I have been told. But we must run aground on some island. Why God now and not Christ? Because Christ, God is the ultimate king. Christ is the king through whom he works, sitting in his right hand. And therefore, it happened as it had been prophesied. Wonderful. The Christ, the Almighty Prophet, encouraging even unsaved people and saving Paul because he had been predestined and appointed to preach to the Caesar, to the mighty ruler of his time. And therefore, he was, God kept him and Christ kept him un, uh, immortal until he would have, would have accomplished his entire ministry. Let's now think of that other verse. I do not exactly know where it is now, but it comes to mind now. Paul was feeling very lonely in the city. He was alone. He said, what am I doing here? The city is so filled with sin. It's a nest of sin. It's a den of sin. And then Christ appeared to him. And the Lord said to him, Paul, do not fear. I have a wonderful message for you. I have many people in the city. You see this den of sin. These thousands upon thousands. I have many people here. They're still lost. But they're not going to remain lost. Because I'm the almighty Christ of heavenly glory. And I'm going to give them to you. And Christ gave them to him. When God works, no man can prevent. No man can hinder. And let us also 
Now think of Acts 11. Let's see what's going on there. Acts chapter 11. How for, I wonder for how long I've been going. I have, do not know when I started. My problem is I'm very bad to know when I started. I look and then I forget again. But in any case, Acts 11, I won't be able to go for much longer. Acts 11 uh, and verse 5. By this time, the Apostle Peter had already won the first from the Gentile nations, the first Cornelius and his household. As far as I know, they were Italian. Am I right? I have had many problems with Italians, I tell you. But I love the elect amongst the Italians. I'm not against the Italians. But let me not let me rather speak good about them. But point is they had been destined to eternal life. And therefore we find here afterwards uh, Peter told the other brothers and sisters what had been happening. Uh, Peter and Cornelius chapter 10, then the report of that in Acts chapter 11, Peter reports to the church. Verse 11, now, verse 1, now the apostles and the brothers who were throughout Judea heard that the Gentiles also had received the word of God. Verse 2, so when Peter went up to Jerusalem, the circumcision party criticized him saying, verse 3, you went to uncircumcised men and ate with them. Verse 4, but Peter began and explained it to them in order. Verse 5, I was in the city of Joppa praying. He was praying on his roof as a good old Jew, good old Israelite. And in a trance I saw a vision. You see the Christ who is the, the prophet of heavenly glory can give us a vision. Something like a great sheet descending. And I'm not a total cessationist. I believe such things still happen. Being led down from heaven by its four corners and it came down to me. And you know what happened. He saw pigs and all kinds of things that they were not swine and allowed to eat according to Jews. And, and he heard a voice saying to him, Rise, Peter, kill and eat. And his Jewish heart, Israelite his heart, told him, I'm too Old Testament to do that. Uh, verse 8, But I said, By no means, Lord, for nothing common or unclean has ever entered my mouth. He was still too ignorant to know that under Christ and in Christ we can eat swine and we can eat all kinds of so-called unclean animals. Christ has made us totally free. So bring the pigs and swine and let us eat them. But the, to the glory of God. He said something of the old Peter came back. Speaking against Christ. Lord, I cannot do it. I'm a Jew. I'm a really good Jew, Jew boy. Here. But... It happened three times. It seems as if God, as Christ, likes to work with Peter three times. Like to work with three times. Again three times. And always drawn up again into heaven. And verse 11, And behold, at that very moment three men arrived at the house in which we were sent to me from Caesarea. Verse 12, And the Spirit told me to go with them, making no distinction. And then what happened? Okay, let me cut it, make it short. I must start moving towards the end of my message. I'm supposed to only preach 35 minutes. The Christ of heavenly glory who is not prevented by space and time, having broken through all those constraints, worked with Cornelius, and he got the message, you must let Peter come. He will speak words to you and to your family so that all of you will get saved. And they were such wonderful people, but still not saved. Such people always in prayer, giving much uh, to the poor, always in prayer to God, etc., etc. Four wonderful things that you cannot even say of Christians and still unsaved. But let Peter come. And while God and Christ were speaking, Cornelius, you must get saved. Let Peter come. You and your entire family need to get saved. The Holy Spirit, uh, Christ was speaking to stubborn Peter and was remained patient enough with him to show him. You better listen. Don't tell me I'm a good Jew boy. And he came and he saved 
and the Holy Spirit fell on them. They received the fullness of the Spirit and salvation at the same time, and they spoke in tongues and they prophesied. You see, and they were filled with joy, and they experienced life more abundantly from the very start. Okay, let me rather stop now. Let us understand. I want to continue, and I want to show you Christ, the Almighty, infinite prophet, Christ, the infinite king, Christ, the infinite priest, works mightily. What a deadly combination against this enemy. And to think that the resurrection of the power of Christ works in and through me, and in and through you, and in and through us. And that is why we must believe what we read in Ephesians 1. If you read Ephesians 1, verses 19 to 23, and even before that, you will see that Paul said, I continue praying for you to get spiritually illumined, uh, enlightened eyes, to realize what power is working in you and for you and through you. It's the Christ, the, God, the power of God that took Christ from the lowest, hardest, the lowest, what do you call it, hardest, the place of the abode of the dead, to the highest heaven. is the greatest power. That power, he now resides in the Christ of glory, and that power now belongs to you because you are in him and he's in you, and you have been appointed to, to be the ones through whom he works. Nothing is impossible. Therefore, Ephesians 3.20, far above everything that we ask in prayer, what we think about, fantasize about, he can suddenly do. He has done throughout the passing centuries. But we have to get spiritually illuminated eyes to realize what Christ has become, whom he has become, and how he's working in and through us as the almighty prophet, priest, and king. And we will find that qualitative growth and quantitative growth will take place. We will grow up in Christ as a body, as Christians, until Ephesians 4, 13 will have become true. The fullness full of the stature, the stature of the fullness of the glorious Christ will be realized among us. And we will realize he's amongst us and he's working mightily in and through us. Let us go for that. And let us say, Lord, save your elect. Give them to us as well. Do not only give, your, why should you only have given them to the first people? And why did, have, have you done so uh, through the passing centuries? Cannot you do something in this country, please? You said, a nation shall be born in one day. Let us trust him. Let us trust him. And mighty things will happen. Praise be unto, and glory unto his name. He paid the price, the dearest price, in order to become the Christ of heavenly glory and to bring us into him so that he can use us as his puny, weak people so that his almighty power, infinite power, of his resurrection can work in and through us for the quality for the kingdom of his coming of his kingdom qualitatively and quantitatively amen